have people joining us online. Thank you for uh, participating. A couple of announcements. Uh, two weeks from today, we have our congregational meeting, annual congregational meeting. That's after the third service. Uh, if you care to pick up papers, uh, there's a green paper back there that's the uh, proposed budget for the next year. And the yellow paper is uh, a listing of the consistory members that are up for uh, election. And then there's the uh, newsletter that's out and available. The only other thing I want to announce is that Bethlehem Buzz, the children's program, is happening next weekend, next Saturday, December 3rd, from uh, 1 to 4. Uh, they need some cookies if anyone make, uh, one wants to make any for the event. And also, uh, if you know of any children and families that want to participate, it's going to be a great, a great event. So I want to mention that. Let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love, your blessing, your provision in our lives. We pray that um, you would help us to focus on you, draw us into your presence, and help us to genuinely worship you, praise you from our hearts, from the depth of our being, as we sing uh, songs anticipating the coming of, your, uh, of the Christ child in this Advent season of the year. We thank you for the love that we have found in Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and we'll sing our first hymn. confess our sins using the confession on the screen. Holy God, you sent your son, Jesus, to be our peace, and yet we know so much strife and war in the world, in our communities, in our churches, and within ourselves. Untie the knots of envy and disappointment that dwell in our hearts. Loosen our grasp on worldly things that we might open our hands to holy things. Turn us around to you and make us whole, we pray. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your forgiveness and your love. And I pray, we pray together that you would really release us from the sin that grips us in whatever form it takes. That you would um, set us free from that set us free from the snares that Satan sets for us in our lives and help us to be free to follow you, and worship you, and live for you all of our days. I pray that if there's any, anyone here this morning, anyone listening online burdened with guilt, that they would confess that and that they would know the truth of the scripture that says, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just 
and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Scripture lesson for the morning is found in the book of James. And it's just a couple of verses because that's going to be the focal point. James chapter 1, I'm reading verses 2 through 4. James 1, verses 2 to 4. This is a scripture. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. This ends a reading of God's holy word. begin this morning differently. Last week I, I uh, had uh, humor in my sermon where I talked about tinfoil, right? I chewed on tinfoil and I, I scolded Steph and I want to apologize to you. I know I don't need to apologize, but sometimes I say, I get cranked up and I say things and I think, no, 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 no. So I apologize for yelling at you and saying, be quiet. Anyway, well, if you, if you, do something wrong publicly, you got to apologize publicly. Anyway, so did you do your assignment? Did you? So the assignment was, if you were here, to write down 50 things for which you're thankful. If you wrote it down and you remembered, hold your thing in the air. Let's see if anybody, if it's on the phone, very good, very good. If you forgot it, you can do it some more. But it was an interesting exercise. Did you do it? Did you do it? Yeah, good. It was an interesting exercise, wasn't it? It, it, I recommend it. If you didn't do it, I I recommend it. I got home from church last week. You do the three services. I I get home about 1 o'clock, something like that. And my grand, one of our granddaughters was with us. Her name is Erin, or uh, uh, Heidi, our daughter is Erin. Erin's daughter, Heidi. And Heidi had already done her assignment. She already had completed it, 50 things I'm thankful for, and she was very proud of her assignment, and she told me clearly that I could not claim this assignment was completed and it was my work. She didn't want me to use her work and claim it. And uh, so I, I, wrote my own, I wrote my own things, but I thought it was, it's just interesting just to hear what the, the, my 11-year-old granddaughter wrote down. She wrote, uh, number one, she's thankful for her guardian angel, which I made a reference to last week, so that was on our minds, and Jesus, the Bible, my family, food, plants, friends, animals, my church, toys, doctors, books, air conditioning, Crafts, hair because it grows fast, Uh, my earrings, I think she just got earrings, Uh, my bed because it's cozy, my flute, uh, which came from her uncle Enoch, Elijah's brother in South Korea, vaccines, she's thankful for vaccines, Uh, my teachers, the school, TV, my pool, they have the amazing pool, um, holidays, Ikea. <laughs> I thought, you must be kidding me, Ikea. 
Uh, I think she's getting, a be- is she getting a bed from Ikea. It's like, you must be kidding me. I've never known anybody be thankful for Ikea before, but she's thankful for Ikea. Uh, shoes, the earth, seasons, the beach, firefighters, lights, coats, um, knowing how to swim, airplanes, her, you know, her other family lives in South Korea, so they wouldn't see him at all if there wasn't for airplanes. Airplanes. Chairs. Is anybody here glad we have chairs? I'm thinking, yeah, I'm glad we have chairs. I'm tired after standing for three services. I can't imagine not having a chair to sit on. But chairs and magazines. Fire. She's concerned about, thankful for fire and firefighters. Mirrors, cars, purses, puzzles, drinks, desserts. FCS class, I think that's like music and art and home ec or whatever. And, uh, oh, I don't know what the, I think it's camera. Uh, Computers, brushes, fantastic grandparents, she wrote. Then she wrote slash, I guess, Gramsy Pampsy. (laughs) That's what Ethan calls me, Gramsy Pamps me, Pampsy. Cups, scissors, glue, Boats, toilet. Any, anybody here remember when you didn't have inside toilets? Are you thankful for outside, inside toilets? Toilets, boxes, emojis. It's like, gotta be kidding me. Pens, ketchup because it, eat, it keeps Ethan happy. My grandson eats ketchup on everything, including turkey for Thanksgiving. You know, you, turkey just isn't complete without ketchup on it, you know. Uh, leaves, towels, and pillows. That was her thank you list. She, she was an overachiever. She did 60 things she was thankful for. But it was, it was just interesting getting home from church last week and reading her list. Now, if you remember from last week, I, uh, I started my sermon and there was a distraction going on. Do you remember this? And I was trying to talk and there's noise happening and a phone ringing and I was trying to get your attention and... Uh, They showed all kinds of pictures. They only have one there. What is that anyway? Is that a dog or a what? A miniature horse with a a tutu on, of course. Why not? Okay, you can kill that. Thank you. But that was, now what was the point of that? Do you remember the point? The point is we need to learn to focus because, and the point of the aluminum foil put it somewhere so I'd have a reminder. Oh, there it is. The point of the aluminum foil is, because I chew on it, it drives Deanna nuts. We gotta learn to tune out the things about which we might complain. As the things we complain about capture so much of our interest, right? It, it just captures our, our focus and we, it, we, we're distracted away from all this to that stuff. Does that happen to you? It seems like this is quieter than the loudness of the things about which I complain. It's just a, a distraction, and I, I need to learn to focus. I need to learn to focus. And the example of somebody that learned how to focus, knew how to focus, was Jesus. We talked about Jesus last week. How he had to, just phenomenal to think about, just a, uh, overwhelming me. The crown of thorns and the spikes in his hands and his feet, and this wound in his side. And yet he's, he's hanging on the cross and he's dying and struggling to breathe and blood loss and the whipping and the beating and all that stuff. And yet he's looking out, he's saying, Mary, take care of, take care of John. John, take care of my mother. And, and he looks at the guys, at the soldiers at the foot of the cross gambling for his clothing. It's been stripped from his body. And he says, yeah, Father, forgive them for that. He's thinking about others thinking about the purpose of God. There's this conversation that's going on between the two thieves, and he's able to focus on what God wants him to focus on over and against the things that would be big-time complaints for me. My, my hands, as I'm, the weight of my body, it's just killing me. I mean, it's just phenomenal to think about how he could, how he could focus on the things of God, and how he could focus on you know, things for which we can be thankful that uh, I don't think I could do. Now, Thanksgiving is a day where people give thanks, and uh, often people might go around the table or certainly in the prayer time before the meal. Even if you don't normally pray, people might pray. They're praying and they're giving thanks to God. But that's just one day of the year. 
And we, we really should live with that kind of attitude 364 other days of the year, the whole year, the whole thing, the whole package deal. And yet it requires focus. And what I want to talk about this morning is how to learn to focus on God and the goodness of God in our life and tune out all the things about which we complain. That's what we talk about, how to do that. And and I want to begin uh, with an example from football. Okay, so here's here's a video from the world of football, training skills. Down and back ball security drill. The purpose of this drill is to teach the running back's ball security while executing a 180 degree change of direction. Key coaching points. The running back must keep the ball high and tight, five points of contact and squeeze to his chest. As the running back approaches each tone, he'll settle his stride, plant his foot, snap his head around and accelerate back towards the second cone. At each of the cones, as running back plants and accelerates, the defensive players will attempt to strip the ball and ensure he's using proper pressure and great ball security. What's interesting about that is they have this ball drill to hold on to the football because the turning point in the game is going to be when the ball is fumbled. And during a game, no matter what your role is, if you're, if you're running back and you're running with the football, you've got to hold on to it. And everybody, you watch a, any game today, and every time the foot, uh, anybody has a ball, they're trying to knock it away. If, if they're running with the ball, they're going to be swatting at it, trying to knock it down. You've seen, I've seen people plenty of times take their helmet and go right into the ball and try to knock it right out of their hands. The receiver that's trying to catch the ball, there's the defender who's trying to swat it away. As soon as it's in the hand, you know, he's trying to catch it, swats it away. It's like you've got to learn to focus on ball security and hold this thing on. But it's not, it's not natural to hold on to the ball, in a sense. Because if I'm, how do you normally run? When I run, I'm running, swinging my arms like this, right? And if I have to hold a ball, the natural way to run is swinging your arm back and forth. Well, what happens when you swing your arm like this? You're vulnerable to, the, to a fumble. They're just going to come along, swat it, it'll fall right out. So you've got to run. You know, if you're going to run with one hand, you've got to wrap it in there and have it real tight, whatever they said in that drill. You've got to learn to focus on this. But as I've said, it's, it's not a natural thing. It has to be developed. It's not going to occur on its own. It just doesn't work that way. And if they do ball control drills in football, it seems to me we need to get spiritual controls spiritual drills, I would say, to try to really hold on to the idea of what we're thankful for and what God's purposes is. And, and so that's what this, this scripture is about that I want to talk about today. Like they just had this, those five points, whatever those five points were in that teaching video, and I'm sure the coaches are drilling that into the kids' heads that are playing, or the people who, heads who are playing this game. But this scripture is a, a teaching on how to hold on to a focus on God over and against all the distractions that are going to take us away from that. So that's what I want to look at today, and it's, it's a scripture I just read a few minutes, minutes ago from the book of James, written by a guy named James. Now, who is James? You might think he's one of the 12 apostles. Not so. I mean, James is one of the 12 apostles, but the guy that wrote the book of James is actually a brother of Jesus. And that's an interesting thing, a physical brother, a biological brother of Jesus. And James had an up and front and center view of Jesus, just watching how he, watching how he developed through life. And James writes five chapters in this book, very practical book, very, very concrete. If you ever read, you want to read a short book of the Bible, book of James, very practical. But he starts out with this very opening statement. And I'm not sure that this is the most important thing, but it's the first thing, you know, what I might say might be the first thing I want to say. You know, this is the thing that's on my mind. The first thing today I wanted to do in this service was to apologize. That was front and center for me. So front and center for James, the very first thing he wrote was, was this statement. So listen to what it says again. He says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way. Interesting. What did he say? If troubles of any kind come your way or when troubles of any kind come your way? He said when. In other words, troubles are going to come to all of us. Every one of us. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. When troubles of any kind, 
It could be a whole diverse number of troubles that encounter us. And if we went around the room this morning, we could speak to different troubles. You'd be surprised by the number of diverse troubles that people just in this room right here have experienced in their life. Some of them would blow our minds, I'm sure, the kind of difficulty people have faced. And James says, when troubles of any kind, any kind, no matter what the experience is, if I went around and said, what troubles are and everybody, and some of them were like, whoa, I can't beat that trouble. That trouble that's very impressive to the rest of us saying, wow, what a trouble that person encountered. James is saying, when troubles of any kind, including that extreme trouble, comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. That is not the way we act. It's like the football thing. It's not natural for me to hold onto the ball with two hands and try to run or certainly hold it like this and run. It's not natural for me to do that. My natural way is, is to run, and it's certainly not natural for any person to, to say, oh, thank you for this trouble. And yet James is saying, here's your drill. It's unnatural, but it's something you need to learn. You need to get this in your head. You need to live this way. So every day, every time they have a practice, I'm sure they work on ball handling drills of some sort or another. And James is saying, every time when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, endurance, your endurance has a chance to grow. So the net result of trouble of any kind coming your way is an opportunity for your faith to grow. You want your faith to grow, don't you, James is saying. As he's, he's watched Jesus, and he says Jesus had an amazing, amazing faith. And he's saying, you know how Jesus got to that point of strength where Jesus could where Jesus could actually hang on the cross and look down from the cross and say, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, and talk to the two thieves and that guy. James is saying the way Jesus was able to get to that place was by doing this thing, considering troubles of any sort an opportunity for great joy. That's what he's talking about here. Any time any trouble. And there's a sense when I read this scripture of a progression. This trouble leads to another trouble, another trouble throughout life. The troubles get progressively, in my opinion, often harder. So let me go all the way back to the time when you were two years old. Do you remember? Now, in my case, I was a charming child and wonderful and favorite child and all that. But if you've ever had a child, you've been around a child. Let's say the child is two years old, and they've been playing, and now it's 7 o'clock or 7.30 or 8 o'clock, whatever the magic time is, and it's time to take them up to bed and put them to bed, you know, and do the bedtime ritual, whatever that entails, and they got toys all over the floor, all right? What does the parent say to the child about the toys all over the floor? Now it's time to pick them up, put them away, and what does the child do? Oh! They collapse like the wicked witch of the West in the Wizard of Oz where she says, I'm melting, I'm melting. They, they just completely collapse. Am I right? Collapse in total exhaustion because of the, pros the prospect of picking up these plastic toys that weigh nothing is just too much for them to bear. Now we laugh. We laugh because what I just described is completely true, right? It's true, we've all seen children do this, and it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. It takes two seconds to pick up, a minute and a half to pick up 25 toys and throw them wherever they have to throw them. It doesn't take any time at all, but the kid is losing their mind, and they're, they're just, just overwhelmed, and from the child's point of view, this is a what? This is a trouble of various kinds. This is a problem. This is this is their experience of adversity. Now that's ridiculous. We're hearing that and saying, this is adversity? This is adversity to a child. It's their first exposure to adversity in their life. And it's like, no. And here's what, here's in my opinion, the mistake that parents will make. How many of you who were parents 
or aren't parents but have heard children losing their minds and going off the deep end, how many of you enjoy listening to the sound of a screaming child losing their mind? Anybody here enjoy that? It's ridiculous. You just, you just want to choke them, you know? It's just ridiculous, right? So, but you don't. Instead, what do you do? You can't do physical violence. You don't do that. So what do you do? You clean them up yourself, right? Is that a mistake? That is a big mistake because now I'm taking away the opportunity for them to grow. And I say, here, child, let's make life easier for you. And then the next time comes around, I'm going to make life easy for you. I'm going to make life. And that's, that's counter, in my opinion, to what this scripture is saying. It's saying, now let's just listen to the scripture, but listen to it speaking to the young child who doesn't understand it, but let's just think of it that way. Dear brothers and sisters, including you two-year-olds, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when you, your faith is tested, your endurance will have a chance to grow. You're going to grow, you're going to mature. And there's a sense of that, there's a progression there. So the child learns to pick up their toys, and then something else happens, and something else happens. And this scripture is saying, it has a chance to grow. Your faith has a chance to grow. Then the next line says, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, wanting, needing, needing nothing. It's just a progression. So I look at Jesus and I say, how did Jesus get to the point where he's able to do the phenomenal thing of hanging the cross and dying and looking down and saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that kind of thing, how did Jesus do that? And the answer, in my opinion, from the observation of James's brother is, he went through adversity. He, he learned to pick up his toys, and then he learned this, and he learned that, and he faced adversity after adversity after adversity, and he gets stronger and stronger as he went through life. Here's the line, the same scripture expressed from the King James Version of the Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials because something harder is going to come down the path in front of you. It's gonna get worse. Is that true? Is life going to get worse? Now that sounds like a pessimistic point of view. Let me spin it this way and see if you agree. See if you agree with this. Um, the scripture says in um, 2 Corinthians, even though our bodies are gradually decaying, yet our spiritual being is renewed day after day. Here's my question. Are our bodies gradually decaying? Anybody? Are our bodies gradually decaying? Anybody? Dennis, are our bodies gradually decaying? Uh, any of us at a certain age will testify to the fact that our knees don't work as well as they used to work, or our minds are not as clear as they used to be. Yeah, I'm more forgetful, that kind of thing. It gets worse, and uh, the body is gradually decaying. There's arthritis in the hands. There's stuff that goes on. Our bodies are gradually decaying. But the line of Scripture says, even though our bodies are gradually decaying, yet our spirit is renewed day after day. My body is declining, but my spirit is getting stronger. What is that really talking about? This inverse relationship, body declining, spirit getting stronger. What it's saying is, as I, in my opinion, linking these two Scriptures together, as I face adversity and embrace it, and I grow. My body decaying is adversity for me. But as I embrace the Lord and look to him and keep my eyes on him and his purposes and the pleasures of life, the, the blessings of my life, as I keep my eyes on him, my body is decaying, but my spirit is getting stronger. And that's the way it's supposed to be in every arena of our life. What we need to learn to do is see life with a different perspective, to see life with a different perspective. Because when we're a child and we say, oh, mother says, father says, clean up your toys. <gasps> it's not natural for that child to say, oh, this is an opportunity for me to grow and mature. They don't see it that way. That's not a natural thing. We don't naturally see things that way. Instead, we focus on the complaining side of the equation. But I believe that the scripture is teaching us we need to see things differently. So here, I, I want to do something fun. I want to show you a picture, and I want you to tell me what you see in this pic picture on the screen. There you go. What do you see? 
What do you see? Call it out. An old lady. Has anybody seen an old lady? See her, see her nose there and her mouth and her hair. Does anybody see anything else in the picture? Anybody see a young lady? See a young lady. How many of you saw initially the old, the old lady? How, anybody see the young lady initially? Initially, okay. Now this is a common optical illusion. It's not, not unusual. You may have seen it before. Watch this if you can't see it. Watch what happens. Go ahead, run the. There's the old lady. I must say, I really enjoy this music. <laughs> okay, so, oh, pop this, pop the still shot again, yeah. So, I naturally see the old lady. Like it's, I've seen this uh, many times. My, my initial response is to see the old lady. So when I need to see, when I want to see the other lady, I have to train my mind. I have to say, okay, there's her chin, there's her jaw, jawline, and there's her little nose, and there's her ear. Oh, okay, I see it now. And I, I discipline myself and I say, oh, now I can see the, the young lady. Or maybe you can see the young lady, can't see the old lady. Okay, there's the old lady's chin, and I, there's her mouth, and uh, there's her eye. Oh, now I see that. But I have, to, I have to focus on, I have to work on seeing this stuff in this image. And I have to, pra I have to discipline my mind. That's what we have to do as we live life. The natural thing for me as a child, my parents says to me, clean up my toys. <gasps> That's the natural thing. I have to discipline myself. Now, a two-year-old's not gonna do this, but I'm not talking to a bunch of two-year-olds here. We can discipline, because God says it in his word, we can discipline our minds and see things differently. And this scripture is actually a command. It says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind, including the one you're facing right now, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. That's like, I see the old lady, I don't see the young lady, I gotta, okay, okay, where's the joy? What's, what's the value of this experience? I've got to see it as an opportunity of great joy. For, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance will, your your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow so that when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. One group of people that I really admire that's just crazy in, in their response to adversity is Paul and Silas, and I again referenced them last week. Paul and Silas in, in Philippi are are, are preaching about Jesus, doing a good thing, and then they're arrested, and they're beat up by the crowd, and then taken to prison, thrown in the inner dungeon, and in the inner dungeon, hands, feet, and stockade, they're singing praise to God. Now, how in the world do you do that? That's counterintuitive. That's like running not the normal way with a football, but really gripping it. That's seeing not the old lady, but the young lady. How did they get to a point? where they're able to, in a counterintuitive counter sense, thank God in the scene of adversity. Here's how, practice. Practice, doing the drill. And the drill is counting all adversity as an opportunity for joy. We've got to do that, and if we do that long enough, we begin to change our mentality. So here's an interesting exercise to get you started. Let's think about the things for which we're thankful. Very good, that was a nice thing for a Thanksgiving sermon to be used. But this has to be part of our, our daily mindset in a daily way. Deanna, Deanna completed her list last night. I talked to her about it. it was, she had also enjoyed the activity. She said, actually, being thankful has become more a part of her life regimen. And the reason she said she thinks it has is because she read a book, when she reads a book and she really gets into it, she reads it repetitiously, where uh, the author Mer Merlin Carruthers, I think his name is, wrote a book, multiple books of the same sort, but it's called Prison to Praise. 
and, and it's from prison to praise. And he, he just talks about giving thanks to God for every single thing. Good thing, bad thing, praising God for everything. And Deanna's really absorbed that, and it's changed her attitude. And when it changes her attitude, it gives her a, a chance for her faith to grow. That's the way it works. And so it's like a drill that we have to do. And if we do this, then even though our body gradually decays, yet our spirit, spiritual being is renewed day after day. That's how it's supposed to work. Here's the command of Scripture by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5 to the subject. He says, always be joyful. Always be joyful. That is absolutely counterintuitive. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Now, that might mean never always be in communication with God. I also think it's always be in awareness of God. Always know that you, whatever situation you're in, God is present with you here and now. And he's saying, always be thankful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, all circumstances, not just good circumstances, bad circumstances, not just these circumstances, all circumstances, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. This is his will for you. Sometimes we might ask, we might ask, what, I wonder what God's will is for me in my life. Here's where it spells it out. This is his will. We're supposed to, in all circumstances, give thanks to God. Now, how does this get implemented in, in our real life? In my opinion, in all circumstances, maybe going through a tough thing, maybe I have a pain in my physical body, I, I don't know that I can really say I'm really, I'm enjoying this. I don't think I can say I'm enjoying this, but I thank you, God. I thank you, God, for what you're going to teach me through this. I thank you, God, for the nurses that are doctors that are caring for me. I thank you for the existence of pain medication that helps me with it. Whatever it is, I need to begin to discipline myself to thank God in all circumstances. So, I wanted to end this morning by giving you a chance. I need a microphone, Dan. I, I thought I'd like to uh, give you a chance to share. You've all did your homework, or some of you at least have done your homework. Give you a chance to say any kind of testimony. I'm going to go around the room. I don't know how the camera works for that, but that's... That's tough luck. You should come. We'd love to have you come to church. But I'd like to have people share. Now, I won't take a long time, but share what you're thankful for. And if you're going through, if this, just share anything, one thing or so, but if you're going through adversity, and in the midst of that adversity, you're thankful for something. I, I would really be blessed to hear that. You know, what's the adversity that you're going through and how are you able to be thankful? Because that's what I was talking about today. So anybody want to share something for which you're thankful? Thank you, Joe. I want to thank God for uh, putting people in my life so that way I'd be able to deal with life itself when things get tough. I really, really am grateful because uh, without these people uh, that he's put in my life, I don't think I could get through it. But thank God for that. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody else? What are you thankful for? Ah, Brad. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. A lot of people did the homework. Go ahead. Good morning. I'm, I'm thankful for... Uh, the brotherhood and sisterhood of this church uh, that teaches me through the Bible how to live, how to act, how to walk, how to be a better person. I uh, thank God for bringing the word through Randy that we have him, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brad. Somebody else want to share a word of thanks? You will? Okay. I'm very thankful for my young daughter, Emily's uh, faith in accepting Jesus Christ. Um, 
She, just watching my own daughter, helps pick me up when I start to go astray and, and I start to lack in my dedication uh, to the Lord and Jesus Christ. So seeing her love for Christ strengthens me and Jesus strengthens us, uh, strengthens us both. And uh, I'm so thankful for that. Thank you. Somebody else? Could be simple too. Could be, I'm thankful for chairs. That's good too. Anybody? What? So, oh, good. Um, about a year and a half ago, excuse me, about a year and a half ago, we had a barn fire. And it was very difficult. But um, through all of that, it was so overwhelming with the support of the community and our family and our friends. Sorry, I'm so nervous. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Just tell me, just tell me. Like the fire was so difficult, but everybody came out and helped. And it was just so overwhelming. It was almost more overwhelming than the fire itself. So how Because did... you felt so loved by people you didn't even really know. And it was amazing. So how do you relate to the sermon today? What did that mean to you? That there was such a positive experience out of something that was so difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was really great. It's hard to share. Anybody else? Did you have your hand out? Uh, you just put your hand out. No, that was, uh, I can't, oh, okay. Got to be very careful about mo motions right now. <laughs> Anybody else? Yours would be interesting to hear. A lot of people are prepared. All right. I'll, oh, oh, there is somebody. Okay. Didn't see your hand. Thank you. Um, a little, whoa, sorry, that was loud. A couple years ago, I was struggling with mental health, and I ended up sitting in the emergency room for eight hours just for their systems to crash, and they sent me home with literally nothing. And after sitting there for eight hours, my mom sat there with me the entire time and talked to me the entire time. So we don't get to pick our parents, but I'm super grateful for the parents that I have. And I feel like parents sometimes don't get enough credit for all the amazing things they do. So I'm super, super thankful for my mom. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody else want to share anything? Okay. Could you pass the mic down? Over there. I'm very hesitant uh, to speak in front of people, <laughs> but um, on the tail end of what she said about uh, her mom, I lost my mom this year, and um, I'm just, it's hard, you know, the holidays, not having her here, and, um, but I'm thankful for her because um, she was 95, and she um, just was such a pleasant, happy person until the very end. And even though she had dementia, she um, was just so happy. I know some people um, can get nasty or, you know, and she was just not ever like that. And it was so nice visiting her until the very end. Thank you. You know what? I'll, I'll call it a, you can give it back to Dan at the end of the service. That's fine. Just take it out then. Let's, uh, let's thank God for those, those uh, expressions. Lord, thank you so much for all the things you do in our lives. A handful of people shared uh, things for which they're thankful. And, and many of us could have shared, but it's, it's hard to speak in front of a group of people on display and maybe, maybe even our emotions are touched and that's, that's something that's uncomfortable for us. But we thank you and praise you, Lord God, for your presence in our life, for all the help you provide us, all the 
comfort, encouragement you give, and for being with us in times of adversity. We just praise you and thank you. And we pray that you'd help us to keep our focus on you always. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to sing our next hymn. I think it's Sweet Hour Prayer. I'm not sure. Whatever it is, we're going to sing it. Yes, it is. 623. Let's stand and sing the hymn together. This time, let us express our faith using the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scripture, and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Lord be with you. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Lord, again, we thank you for uh, this day and we thank you for your love and for your generosity in our lives. As, as well as thanking you, uh, we do pray that you would care for those that are sick among us, those who are struggling, those who have very real challenges, those who have, are facing crises in their lives, relationally and otherwise. Lord, we pray that you would be at work and that you would uh, be working in our world and drawing all people unto yourself so that they would experience life in you as we have. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. I uh, want to thank those of you who did share uh, a moment ago. Just appreciate you having the courage to do that. And now we want to prepare to take communion. We have at the Lord's table uh, the bread and the wine for the Lord's Supper. We invite to this table all who are members of a Christian church who desire peace with their neighbor and who seek the mercy of God. Luke the evangelist wrote of our risen Lord when he was at table with two of the disciples. He took bread, blessed, broke it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were open and they recognized him. In company with all believers in every time and beyond time, we come to this table to know him in the breaking of the bread. For the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord God. We give you thanks, Lord God, our creator, for bringing the worlds into being, for forming us in your likeness, for recalling us when we rebel against you, and for keeping the world in your steadfast love. We praise you especially for Jesus Christ, who was born of Mary and lived as one of us, who knew exactly the life that we know and yet was obedient to your purposes, even to his death on a cross. We thank you that you stamped his death with victory by raising him in power and by making him head over all things. We rejoice in the continuing presence of the Holy Spirit in the church you've gathered in its task of obedience and in the promise of eternal life. With the faithful in every place and time, we praise with joy your holy name. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full, are full of the majesty of thy glory. Hosanna. Bless now by your word and spirit, both us and these gifts of bread and wine, that in receiving them at this table and in offering here our faith and praise, we may be united with Christ and one another and remain faithful to the tasks he sets before us. In the strength Christ gives, we offer ourselves to you, giving thanks that you have called us to serve you. Amen. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Jesus Christ. And through the cup of blessing, we celebrate the new life that is ours through him. Come for all things are ready. You may be seated.
bread which you hold in your hands represents the broken body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As you eat it, eat it with thanksgiving, for he gave his life for you that you might live for him. You may eat the bread. The wine which we hold in our hands represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ who died for us. As you drink the wine, let's drink it with the desire to be filled with his Holy Spirit. You may drink the wine. Stand together and give thanks to God using the words printed on the screen. 
We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of your Son, Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's sing our concluding hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore, world without end. Amen. May God's blessing surround you each day as you trust him. In